Thank you, Senator. Senator Director, members of the uh, Labor and Commerce Committee, I'm Peter Merrill, uh, Planning and uh, um, Communication and Main Housing. Um, I'm going to read the boilerplate that we don't usually use for starters. The uh, Maine, housing, uh, Maine State Housing Authority is Maine's housing finance agency, created by the legislature in 1969 to address the problems of unsafe, unsuitable, overcrowded, and unaffordable housing. We are authorized to issue bonds to finance single-family and multi-family housing units for Maine's low and moderate income citizens. Most of these bonds carry the moral obligation of the state. We are structured to use private methods for public purposes to be independent, nimble, and responsive. We are authorized to act as an agent on behalf of the state in administering the federal weatherization and fuel assistance programs, uh, a federal housing block, block grant, the federal low income housing tax credit program, and homeless uh, grant programs. We collect and distribute federal rent subsidies, uh, state general fund revenue for homeless programs, and receive a dedicated portion of the real estate transfer tax in the home fund, as this committee knows. Um, LD 1778 speaks to the core structure of the authority, and so rather than speak for or against, we'd rather speak neither for nor against and just work with you, um, offer our perspective, maybe some suggestions, and hopefully come out with a, a, a good product in the end. In the long term, our interests are with the best interests of the authority. Maine Housing is one of a number of so-called quasi-independent authorities created by the state. The state has many other independent units, the university, Baxter Park, uh, so on and so forth. The ones you are most familiar with, FAME, the Bond Bank, Education Loan Authority, and the Health and Higher Education Facilities Authority, are the same in that they are essentially financial institutions. We sell private activity bonds, as you know, and, and uh, just passed uh, again uh, the other day. And uh, we operate at an arm's length from the state. The reason for the independence is to isolate us from too much political influence. Political influence is not the same as accountability and transparency, which we'll talk about in a minute. As a financial institution, we are obligated to our bondholders and to the people of Maine. It is our obligation to protect their interests. One way we do that is to make sure that politics does not influence who we lend money to or weaken the quality of our portfolio. Put another way, we are, we are created independent so that we don't spend four years um, uh, making loans to developers who are favored by one governor or one party, and then the next four years doing the same to the other party or the other uh, uh, governor. Our bondholders rely on that independence. Another way that we maintain the financial integrity uh, is that our commissioners are not involved in specific underwriting decisions on, on each individual project. They do set the parameters that, within which we make those decisions. Now, the other day, I believe I heard on the computer, and he's not here to appreciate this, but um, Representative Dow talked about Freddie Blashing. You may remember <coughs> that, the sugar beet king of Aristic County. Um, and that's why we have FAME today, and we no longer have the Maine Guarantee Association. And FAME is set up in, in a very independent way, um, not uh, kind of the way this is, this is headed, but they're set up in a very independent way, and we are set up in a very independent way. And um, I just uh, have to bring uh, Blashing's uh, name to your attention because that was a huge problem, and to this day, the staff at Fame have people coming up and asking them about that loan and when are they going to get their money back and so on and so forth. Miserable situation. But it speaks to the importance of the independence of these lending agencies. LD 1778 proposes to change the governing structure of Maine housing. Our structure is a bit different than most other quasi-independent authorities. It is true that the, the commissioner's authority is specifically delineated in law and all else is vested with a director. Kind of, kind of like the 10th Amendment. <coughs> From a strat practical standpoint, commissioners have far more control. They are nominated by the governor, approved by you, confirmed by the Senate. They pass the annual budget, as Senator Contos explained. And when you control a budget, you control just about everything. In addition, they approve all of our program rules, and they decide when, or, when we will and will not sell bonds. So, despite the fact that certain powers are vested with the director. The fact is, um, 
the board has a responsibility for just about everything we do. So they do have, in fact, a lot of control. Nevertheless, we're here because of two issues. First is the cost of affordable housing, far more complicated issue than has been suggested in the press, I think. It involves public policy decisions made by the legislature, including incenting historic preservation and discouraging smart growth by barring our putting multifamily uh, projects in certain rural areas. Um, and you can see at, at the back, very last page of my testimony, I believe, is a chart that shows some of the costs on uh, uh, associated with, with that. And, and the historic preservation, I would just remind you, is not paid for by us. It comes from state and federal uh, um, funds independent of us. Those decisions on cost are covered by the Qualified Allocation Plan, which Senator Congress referred to, which is adopted by the commissioners. And the, we do this every year or two, and we're doing it again, and uh, the board is having uh, lots of input on this, and we will be addressing the cost of housing in that. Second reason we're here is the suggestion that we're not spending our funds in an appropriate way. Easy enough to demagogue, but we're confident that when an independent review is completed, it will be clear that none of our expenditures were illegal, unethical, or inappropriate. We have seven suggestions to offer that I think hope will enhance the bill. These are offered as good government. Uh, uh, some of them are technical, some of them are substantive. Uh, we presented them in one unified amendment, but I've given you a menu so you can uh, look through them and decide what you like and what you don't like. Uh, some of this, um, uh, as our attorneys looked at the draft, they said, well, you know, there's a better way to write this, and so we, we've offered some of that. <coughs> Bless you. First, uh, the advisory board. Uh, the advisory board was created by this legislature and abolished by this legislature. References to the advisory board in this particular section might just as well be, this is like, this is like the shells and the must. If you go into the section, we should clean it up. So that, that should be taken care of. And I would, I would comment, by the way, on the advisory board. The reason we had an advisory board, it was like 10 or 15 people. And it was made up of people so that they could advise us. And these were people who theoretically would have a conflict of interest. That we talked about conflict, a couple of people talked about conflict of interest. I myself served on the board for four years and did not get a second term because the nature of my job had changed and I had a conflict of interest and so uh, couldn't do that. So the advisory board was created for people who would have a conflict of interest. But it's, it's been done away with for years. And so. Uh, to Mr. Uh, McCarthy's suggestion of expanding the board, it's almost like bringing back part of that advisory board function, something worth uh, talking about in, in depth, I think, considering. Second is the duties of the commissioners. This is, this is, um, this is it's, it's a, a drafting issue only. If, in fact, the uh, board is going to be given all the powers uh, and duties of the authority, then that whole long list of things in law that are uh, given to the directors, uh, given to the uh, commissioners, can just be taken out and replaced with a sentence that says the powers of the Maine State Housing Authority are vested in the commissioners. Then you don't need uh, one through eight um, in there. Number three, chair's voting power. This is a very minor issue, um, but it, it's, it's, you know, we're here and we might as well clarify this. When the board, uh, when this committee changed the board structure and to have the governor, this is the governor by the way, appoint the chairman of the board, um, somebody, a member of this committee said, well, all the boards I'm on, the chair doesn't vote, uh, except in a tie. And so the committee said, that's great, we'll, we'll write it in that way. Really what that's about is Robert's Rules of Order. What Robert's Rules of Order says is the chair ought to be working to get the group to work together, get to the common goal, and so on and so forth. And so Robert says that you don't vote unless it matters. So it matters if there's a tie and you get to vote and you break the tie. It also matters if to create a tie. A chair under Robert's Rules can vote to create a tie, which therefore defeats the motion. And the third way is if there's a, an Australian ballot or a secret ballot which isn't particularly germane in our, in our case. But in any event, that's what our third um, amendment would do, simply expand slightly the chair's um, authority to vote to be consistent with what was the intent. Number four, commissioner to hire, commissioners to hire and fire. The bill that, that, John, uh, that Senator Courtney has presented uh, continues to have the governor appoint the director and 
gives the commissioners complete authority to fire the director. Now, in an extreme circumstance, you could run a director through the process here. You could vet them. Uh, the governor could nominate. You could vet. The Senate could could uh, not oppose, and send them down the street. And a couple of months later, they could be fired, um, just because there was a difference of opinion between this building and ours. And so I, I think that's just inefficient. And in most cases, um, as has been mentioned, 38 out of the 50 states, all the New England states, all the local public housing authorities, uh, the Turnpike Authority, the Retirement System, Efficiency Main Trust, Main Education Loan Authority, Main Health and Higher Education Facilities Authority, the Bond Bank, uh, almost everybody it gives the, uh, the board the authority. If you're going to fire, you get to hire and you set the salary because that, that just makes sense. Number five is removal of commissioners. This is, this is, this is again, this is just um, uh, revisers, uh, you know, draft. This is just a drafting thing. When, and, and probably, the, you know, our, our attorneys are more familiar with our statute than perhaps the revisor's office is on a regular basis. And so uh, the revisor's office, the way the revisor's office wrote section two, it works. But the better way to do it would be, uh, we propose simply deleting the word director in that section because the word director was only added when the Maine State Housing Authority was added to that section. And so this would be consistent with the uh, legislative history and the way, the way it was created. It would just make more sense when you know, some arguing lawyers five years from now are looking at the statute and trying to figure out what was intended. That just, and they go back and look at the history, that would make more sense. Number six, and there are only seven. Number six, staggered terms. In 2007, this has been touched on, in 2007, the legislature added three commissioners to our board. The terms were not staggered. Uh, they were not integrated with the existing seats. As a result, we have one seat expiring in 2012, one seat in 2013, one seat in 2014, and five seats in 2015. There are a couple of ways, this has been a concern in this committee, I think you've mentioned it um, already, um, and we were, uh, I was advised um, by what you did with Fane in, in, in considering what to do about this, but one, there are a couple ways you can do it. One is you can simply add, it took me, it took me a lot of paper, I had to draw this out to figure it out, but, you could add one year, to, there, three commissioners started on, uh, on a certain date. You could add one year to the term of the first one, two years to the term of the second, and three years to the term of the third, and that would solve the problem. And if somebody, the, the, the guy with a short straw at seven years, could simply resign early, fill successor fills, and so on and so forth. Alternatively, you could decrease the terms of existing directors, um, or you could uh, do very short terms, which is probably the least palatable of those least, most, yeah, it wouldn't work very well. Number seven, we would propose an effective date for section one and section two of February 3rd, 2014. Taking people at their word that this is not about the current director, then it makes sense to have these changes take place at the end of the current term. Traditionally, a change of this sort would take place uh, at the end of the term. Would also address any concerns that the firing of the director before the end of her term could be considered a breach of contract. Contract. I, I, I thank you for your consideration of our thoughts and, and our proposals. We've, we've worked uh, closely with this committee for years and years, and uh, we are dedicated, as I think you know, to the organization. Maine Housing has grown and improved since it was created in 1969. Today, as you heard, the $1.6 billion financial institution, helping 90,000 Mainers a year investing about $1.2 million a day in the main economy. We look forward to working with you to ensure that we will be just as successful, successful in the next 43 years and beyond. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Thanks for the suggestions. We appreciate them. Uh, are there questions of the committee from Mr. Merrill? Representative Tuttle. Thank you, Peter, for your testimony. Uh, in Mr. McCarthy's testimony, he mentioned the conflict of interest we write. Do you know what that was about? Uh, I would defer to him on that. No, I, I, I no. Con conflict of interest has been has been a, uh, a a real challenge because we have we have Maine's conflict of interest law, 
And then we have all of the, when, when I didn't get a second term on the board, it was not because of Maine's law, it was because of federal um, requirements. And, and as Senator Condos mentioned, we had uh, really good board members who have been through this entire process helping, contributing, and absolutely staying away from anything that touched anything they did, or they might even be, you know, you know Caesar, Caesar's wife and the whole thing. Um, and yet, uh, HUD said, no, can't do it. Um, so, uh, it, and maybe that gets to the, the, the advisory uh, board that, that we had talked about earlier. Any other questions to the board? Uh, uh, pardon me, I'm sorry, Representative. Well, no, uh, terms of office, what are we talking about now here? Uh, the director has a four-year term. There are no terms for the uh, commissioners. So they can go on forever. Yes, generally they get tired after. What do other two states? Terms. What, what do other states normally do? They, maybe we can look at that for the work session. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And the um, term limits. On the commissioners. On the commissioner and board members. What are your feelings about it? Um, we haven't talked about that in house. Um, but generally, um, and this is a heresy, I suppose, over here. But you know, generally, term limits, you know, try to protect you from yourself. Um, Does it work here? Uh, we. <laughs> there was a 40, 45 percent turnover in the legislature the year before term limits took effect. I think, if I, if I recall correctly, and nobody knew anybody. You know, the, the, the short circuit. Do I trust him? I have no idea. Um, I'm just looking at some of these terms. Uh, you know, if, if you haven't, I, I served on a, on a board, in, uh, a volunteer board in Portland, and, and uh, a friend of mine had introduced the concept of term limits. And it was strict. And the problem was you get through three terms, and you're, you sometimes had some of the very best people were, were getting pushed out the door. Also, all the deadwood. I mean, in, in a way, term limits is a lazy way of getting deadwood in volunteer organizations. Um, and so we, we now have, have the Merrill Codicil, which, which allows, under certain circumstances, for, for uh, terms to be extended. I, I don't, uh, term limits strikes me as, as a, a, what somebody said earlier, a solution in search of a problem. We haven't seen that issue on our board. Thank you, Mr. Sorry to ramble. Any other questions? Representative Bolt. <coughs> um, just going to back to your fifth removal of commissioners, I guess I'm a little confused. So you're suggesting there would be no way for the board to, to remove a director? No, no, oh no, no, no. This is this is strictly this is strictly a, number five is strictly a drafting issue. If you look in section two of the bill, it um, adds the word commissioner a couple of places, and at the very bottom it says. This section does not apply to the director of the Maine State Housing Authority who serves at the pleasure of the Board of Commissioners. Oh. What all, all we're saying, I, really our, our crack attorneys are suggesting, is that you can do the same thing by simply deleting the word director, which only was put into the statute when Maine housing was added to it. So once, if, if it's not going to apply to the director, there's no reason for the word director to be in there anyway. And so you can, it's just an easier, it's a different way, it's lawyers arguing, but it's a different way of drafting it. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank, Thank you very much. much.